Здравствуйте. Всем доброго времени суток. Меня зовут Майк. Добро пожаловать в Кэмпкаст. У меня сегодня в гостях Юлия Соловьева из сообщества English One. Мы с Юлей сегодня разговаривали на многие интересные темы. В том числе мы говорили о билингвизме. То есть как надо воспитать воспитать своего ребенка так, чтобы он говорил и понимал идеально на двух языках, какой для этого требуется подход, с какого возраста надо начать и так далее. Действуя в том же духе, то есть духе билингвизма, я решил записать введение этого подкаста на русском, что, как вы знаете, является редкостью для, для моего контента. Это, во-первых, во-вторых, Юрий, если ты смотришь, это для тебя. Юрий у меня учится в разговорном клубе в одной из групп, и он во время последнего занятия жаловался о том, что он не может найти никакого контента на моей странице, где я что-то говорю на русском. Так что вот, Юрий, надеюсь, что ты этим доволен. Вот тебе пример, как я разговариваю, и не просто так скажем, впихиваю рандомные русские слова в английские предложения. Итак, надеюсь, что вам всем понравится сегодняшний подкаст. Three, two, one, and Yulia, hello. Hello, Mike. Nice to see you. And you, and you. Thanks for joining me. Um, well, I know uh, you, you, Thank you, you, for you requested that we did this a little bit earlier than I suggested because you have to walk your dog. <laughs> so I hope you had a great sleep and I didn't disturb you too early. No, not at all, not at all. Well, it's um, I was woken up by torrential rain and thunderstorms outside um we've got some of the worst weather i've ever seen um and i've woken up and basically actually i'm going to show you and i'm going to unplug my computer uh hopefully it won't die i don't know how much the battery's charged up so i am um, i keep my my motorbike outside on the street for people who are listening to the audio version of this i'm showing julia my motorbike oh and my you can God. see the cover yeah. has been ripped or what Or just rain? Just rain, just rain. That's common. Yeah, I see there. puddles. Yeah, lots of puddles. Poor um, motorbike. Yeah, the, <laughs> At least it's covered. Well, no, it's not. That's the thing. The cover is what I'm trying to show you. Can you see? Is absolutely uh, yes. ripped to shreds uh, by yes, wind. Yes. Um, so I'm urgently trying to find either a garage um, or um, someone who can um, or go and buy a new cover, which is probably what I'm going to have to do. Uh, but yeah, it's not good news. It's not good news. Um, but anyway, at least the bike's still there. hasn't been stolen. That's the that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, great news. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So, um, you know, obviously, you are, um, you know, I think known by a lot of people who are going to listen to this podcast um, from your um, activities on uh, your VK page, um, as well as obviously, you know, your 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 teaching content. I um, just want to go ahead and tell people about what's your page called, what sort of stuff can we find there and, and what yeah. can we find it? Sure. So actually, I have always been interested in languages, especially the English language. It says it has always been my passion, my true passion. And um, maybe uh, when I was six, I started learning English. So it was not too young, but still um, at those times it was young. Uh, it was an early age to start uh, yes, learning the language. So um, I have been teaching English for more than uh, half of my life, I, <laughs> I guess, because I started when I was 18. Uh, and yes, yeah, so this web page, this English VAM, it's called English VAM. Uh, it's mostly a mixture of uh, all those uh, things connected related to Cambridge exams, preparation stuff and uh, uh, also, I post some interesting facts and tricks about how to 
learn some things in English, how to acquire some use of English um, aspects, yeah, and uh, maybe uh, uh, to prepare better for the reading part and things like that. Uh, and also I try to post there a lot of information related to my new project, which I launched not very a long time ago this summer. It's a small uh, online school for bilingual children. So it's a kind of combination of different resources which I can find on web and which I consider myself really worthwhile. Yeah, and uh, um, I try to design something on my own. So I have some projects which um, I um, launched myself and I'm an author of this material. So where it's not just a compilation of somebody else's resources, but I made it myself for uh, mostly for either uh, people who prepare themselves for Cambridge exams or for bilingual children. So from mm -hmm. age like uh, three years old uh, till 12 years old. Mm -hmm. That's so this, this is, um, and there's lots of interesting things I wanted to talk to you about, but this, this is one of them. Um, bilingualism is a very uh, fascinating topic. So you, you say that your new project is to um, is is like a school for um, yeah, very very young learners for bilinguals. Um, so th there's I think there's there's an important difference here to draw between um, someone who's very proficient and someone who's bilingual because um, you know yeah. ob obviously you know I I've spent a lot of time for example learning Russian and I, I've lived in in Russia for a number of years I, I speak Russian at home um, you know it, Russian is the language that I use most often when I'm when I'm not um, you know obviously at, at work um, but I would never consider myself to be bilingual and, and mm -hmm. I think you know even though you've been learning English from the age of six and you're a professional teacher and you know you obviously have a very very high standard of English I don't think you would you would call yourself a bilingual absolutely but, right yeah. so what's the difference between someone who is proficient mm -hmm. um, e even someone who is um, a akin to a native speaker and someone who is bilingual uh, you know, it's a great question because there has been a uh, lot of debates about what can be called, uh, what actual, what person can be called a bilingual one, right? Because uh, some scientists do uh, suppose that um, there is not some age standard in which a person can stop becoming a bilingual one, right? So even if you are like 90 or 80 years old, if you are immersed in this uh, language, natural language uh, environment, you can still become a bilingual uh, person. But I, for one, uh, stick to the uh, opposite opinion that, um, and it's a question, actually, it's a matter of the choice and of the terminology, how we personally perceive it. Yeah, for, for example, for me and for all my theoretical um, a theoretical background, yeah, that uh, I uh, base all my uh, projects on, I uh, consider uh, a bilingual person, a person who acquired the language, not learned it, yeah, and I think that this is the uh, most essential term, uh, acquisition, language acquisition versus language learning, yeah, so for instance, I will now uh, go in more detail uh, to explain what is meant by this language acquisition versus language learning uh, binomial. Yeah? So actually, uh, when we uh, speak about acquisition, we uh, don't see the language as the purpose of learning. Yeah? So acquisition is a, a kind of natural subconscious process that happens usually with uh, uh, newborn children when they are spoken in uh, uh, some absolutely some particular language too. Yeah? So when a person is born, uh, he or she is not prepared to speak any language. So uh, it's just about um, getting immersed in some particular language environment and uh, um, starting acquiring certain patterns of language, starting to react adequately to the uh, impulse, to the stimulus, uh, which is given by parents first and then some other people, relatives, friends, and so on and so forth. Yeah, the world is expanding uh, day to day. So I think that this acquisition is possible only until, uh, I mean, this natural acquisition, yeah, is possible only until you are like six, seven years old, yeah? because then you start, uh, you stop absorbing the language like a sponge and your um, ability to activate uh, all those structures and language channels that you hear very quickly in your speech 
to turn uh, to transfer them from passive vocabulary to active vocabulary uh, is drastically reduced after the age of seven, and uh, that's when you stop um, when you uh, when you lose this ability to become a bilingual uh, person. Uh, because what happens afterwards, you can really, uh, for example, you can immigrate to uh, an English speaking country where English is a national language and it's widely spoken, but uh, you will feel that it's um, kind of second language, okay, but maybe not foreign, but it's a second language, not the first one. Yeah, so it's not the natural ability that you now develop in order to respond in this language and in order to perceive the language as well. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I'm interested, like what you said right at the beginning of that, that there, there are some scientists who still believe that um, you, you, can, you can become bilingual even as an octogenarian or, or you know, right into your old age. Uh, obviously, you know the literature much better than I do. Um, I have at times delved into this topic, but I'm by no means any form of expert. Um, which scientists believe that and what's their evidence? Uh, you know, I have uh, read lots of them, both Russian and uh, foreign uh, books about uh, bilingualism. And uh, uh, for instance, um, if we speak about the um, um, overseas literature, like uh, Raising Bilingual Bilateral Children in Monolingual Cultures, written by Stephen Kelders, uh, or another book, um, it's called A Parents and Teacher's Guide to Bilingualism, uh, Colin Baker, yeah, um, they uh, accept the fact that sometimes uh, bilingualism can be perceived as just an ability to speak two languages naturally and uh, fluently. Ah, okay, okay, and that, yeah, so that, that was the second part of what I wanted to say. It's not really a question, it's more just a, a, a rebuttal to people like that who, like, yeah, okay, if, if you want, you can use this word bilingual to talk about someone, for example, like you, who speaks two languages, or I don't know if you speak any other languages, but let's just stick with Russian and English, who speaks two languages um, naturally and fluently. But mm -hmm. okay, then we still need another word to talk about this other thing, because they're two different things. Because right. not, not I, not you, we, we are not bilingual in the sense of someone who has, you know, been raised with two different languages. Yeah, absolutely. They're different things. And, um, you know, having met a couple of bilingual kids in my time and a few bilingual, obviously, adults. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a completely different ballgame. Completely different ballgame. Yeah, absolutely right. So no matter uh, how how uh, hard, uh, how, how hard working, how industrious we are and how attentive we are to details while we are learning another foreign language, it's still a foreign language for us. We were born with another system, yeah, language system, and we were accustomed to some uh, other patterns and even uh, not only linguistic, but cultural ones. And uh, uh, it's a real difference. It's kind of a gap, even if the languages are very close, if they, even if they come from one group, yeah, like for instance, Sp Spanish and French. Uh, yeah, but uh, still they uh, might have lots, lots, lots uh, in common, but still you, uh, if you, if you haven't acquired the language, if you have learned it, it will never become your mm, mother tongue. Mm. And a lot of the time, this it, it gets more complicated as well. And I, this is slightly going away from what you're talking about, but I think it gets more complicated, especially when it comes to issues of cultural or national identity. If you're listening to me, I sound like a social science nut job. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes, so a lot of the time, uh, people who claim to be bilingual often are not telling the entire truth because, um, for example, it very often in Russia, you'll meet people who say that they are bilingual in Russian and Ukrainian. Uh -huh. And if you ask 90% of those people, they don't really speak Ukrainian. Like, you know, I used to know a guy who um, was, you know, very proud of his Ukrainian roots and, you know, um, you know, he had quite like, you know, Ukrainian kind of appearance. Um, and, and, you know, he was always going on about how, you know, he, he um, could, could speak the language fluently and then he couldn't tell me the days of the week in Ukrainian. Mm. Like, mm, sorry, you're not bilingual. Um, the same thing is, is true of um, people who s claim that they speak Welsh or Irish in, mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. It's a national kind of identity thing. But then when you really, really 
investigate what they're talking about, they don't really speak the language. Um, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's right. Mm -hmm. So if let's say then that obviously it's it's too it's too late uh, for me and you we're nearly on our pensions by you know in terms of linguistic acquisition um, but let's say that you're you're a parent and you've got a kid who's um, you know either newly born and so you're planning their their sort of educational development going forward what is a sort of step-by-step -step guide how can I raise my child to be bilingual and more importantly um, how can I make English a part of my child's daily routine? Mm -hmm. So yeah that's a great question it's not um, a rocket science for uh, parents who uh, speak English at least I mean if we speak about English Russian bilingualism yeah and if we speak now about Russian parents who would like to raise their children in two languages Russian and English yeah and if they speak even one of them if they speak uh, B2, C1 level of English, that's not uh, rocket science, as I've said, to um, raise their children bilingually, because, uh, you know, uh, the earlier we start, the better. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes parents really are intimidated by those, um, uh, you know, language therapists who warn them against that. Oh, no, don't start before they start speaking Russian properly. Yeah, so and that's a problem, I think, because here we don't speak about the uh, pronunciation or we don't speak about their uh, clear sounds. Yeah, we speak about the systems which we try to incorporate in their brains as early as possible in order uh, to uh, help them uh, develop these natural language uh, acquisition skills. And uh, uh, the, the earlier the better. Well, I, for one, uh, made a great mistake because I was not uh, well informed about that uh, aspect that aspect of becoming a bilingual child when I uh, had my own uh, baby. Um, of course, if I had my own baby right now, I would start from the very first day of his, <laughs> of his or her life. Um, yeah, so, um, but uh, then it was not until my son turned one year and a half when I started uh, speaking English with him, not only Russian. And first, uh, it was like, 50-50, 50 percent 50, 50 uh, of our time I spent uh, speaking with him in Russian and the other half of the time I spoke English with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, when he turned two, I decided that um, I was like uh, the only person just, I, I realized I was the only person with whom he spoke Russian, with whom he spoke English and I decided to invite a, a native speaker teacher who, who would entertain him twice a week. So they played, they drew, they even walked for a walk, or they went for a walk together, they uh, watched cartoons, they acted out those stories with stuffed toys and rubber toys and everything that he had. Uh, Chloe? Ah, uh, not yet. First it was Tiffany. I, I, I <laughs> then, yeah, she was replaced by Chloe, then she was replaced by uh, Sarah, and we had lots of lots of other native speakers who just came and entertained my son. Mm -hmm. uh, together with me always and uh, I also was uh, very, uh, it, it was always a bee in my bonnet to um, provide him an adequate English speaking environment mm -hmm. and it was like um, maybe for four years uh, he was educated both in, uh, and raised both in uh, English and in Russian uh, but then school began and everything changed and I think that it's a problem not only with my family, but with the majority of families where uh, children are raised bilingually. Because when school begins, children stop um, having so much uh, common time with their uh, quality time with their parents mm -hmm. who try to raise them bilingually. Uh, they are either at school or at some courses that are supplementary to school subjects and uh, they um, can, can go for, for example, they can... Um, I take up some sports clubs and everything, yeah, and uh, that's why if they are even at home, they are mostly uh, occupied, busy with their homework, which is obviously in Russian, if they go to a state Russian school, mm -hmm. and even the English language that is uh, taught there from the second form, it's an absolutely different subject, it has nothing in common with what <laughs> they, uh, they are accustomed to. Yeah, and uh, it's a kind of shift in their minds. Um, they have to speak, they have to listen to the Russian speech during their English subject at school. 
and it's an eye opener for them that a person who can speak who can speak mm -hmm. both Russian and English doesn't speak English when he can. She can. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's that's an interesting one. That um, when you have bilingual children who try to do um grammar exercises so if you have a bilingual russian english child bilingual. Trilingual. i've had a, a trilingual russian kazakh um english uh child before and um that we were doing some very basic grammar exercise in the class and he was just incapable of doing it rather like if you just gave a native russian speaker an exercise from you know a book about learning russian as a foreign language they would be absolutely yeah. clueless just as like yeah. if you gave um, you know, a, a native English speaker, an IELTS exam, you know, a lot of right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I want to rewind a little bit because I think there's, there's um, two things that I think um, our viewers slash listeners would like me to just to um, unpack a little bit mm -hmm. in what you were just saying. So first of all, um, when you say that um, this sort of, you know, um, misconception that you need to wait until your child can speak Russian correctly and then introduce English. You're saying that that is uh, a mistaken opinion. Um, could you just go into a bit more detail about that? Is there, for example, not a danger that they won't become bilingual, they'll become sublingual in both languages as a result? Uh, as I said, uh, the earlier the better, just because uh, the, um, uh, if, uh, for instance, if parents start at four and five years old, they have uh, limited time. This, uh, um, as I've already mentioned, when children turn seven, they lose this ability to acquire a language. They start learning the language like they learn um, geography, history, and uh, literature. So that becomes, that, that becomes a subject for them, not a tool to acquire information about the world around them, yeah, about everything else. And uh, uh, this ability, yeah, they just lose time. I mean, if they start earlier at, at one, at two years old, uh, they would just have more time for, uh, to raise their children bilingually and the child will get more opportunities to absorb more language, uh, to absorb more structures, to absorb more stylistics, grammar, and different, different aspects of language, yeah? It just will be, uh, it will be more, um, so to say, uh, uh, it, it will be easier for the child yeah, to speak uh, the language more fluently in the future. Yeah? Because just uh, you can uh, understand that this is a kind of proportion uh, when you have more time on raising a child bilingually, you will uh, achieve more results. And you will achieve higher results, yeah, and uh, that's uh, it, it. Would only it would sound only natural uh, if uh, we uh, draw a parallel uh, between the earlier they start, uh, the more uh, language acquisition um, results mm -hmm. they will. Get. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the second thing that I wanted to um, unpack at, for, uh, in greater detail was, um, you said that even if. You know, so if you as a parent, if your level is B1, B2, that's still sufficient to raise your child bilingually, um, which strikes me as strange. If you're if you're not as a parent, if you are not of at least a very high level of proficiency or native standard, how can you raise your child bilingually? How does that work? Uh, you know, uh, nowadays this idea uh, has become really popular and it's wide, widespread, yeah, and there are even courses and online courses for parents who would like to raise their children bilingually where teachers teach them or tutors teach them how to um, advance their own language, uh, well, where their own uh, level of language um, in terms of those topics that they will need to discuss with their children. Yeah? So for instance, if their baby is uh, interested in trucks and lorries and things like um, um, trains and airplanes, yeah, space whatsoever, they would speak about uh, these topics and they would enlarge parents' vocabulary and uh, uh, polish parents' grammar and brush up the skills that they need to communicate with their children uh, in these topics, yeah, the, the topics of their interest. Uh, because uh, when you are uh, when you are introducing English to a young child's life, I think that the most important, essential, maybe the key point of this process should be that you should uh, relate English to the sphere of his or her interests. Yeah, and uh, uh, and it and it works not only with little children because when we speak about teenagers who have just started learning English and uh, mostly they start doing it in school. 
Mm, and the parents complain that they don't have interest in the subject, that they, uh, it, 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 it seems boring and it seems dull for them. Yeah, I think that the main, um, the, the maybe uh, the main uh, turn point here could be to shift their attention to, to uh, what they like and do it in English. For example, if they like cooking, like girls, for instance, they like cooking and uh, uh, it's up their street, why are you not to browse on the internet and find some YouTube channels in cooking in English and start doing it yeah. together? Yeah, sure. All right then, all right then. That sounds a lot like uh, uh, CLIL, which I know is another area of um, speciality of yours, just to, um, to unpack that for our, for our listeners. Um, what does CLIL stand for? What's the acronym? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, so CLIL is content and language um, in, uh, integrated learning. Yeah, content and language integrated learning. So it means that, uh, again, the language here is not the purpose and it's not the subject that we learn, but it's more of a tool with the help of which other subjects are learned mm -hmm. and other, um, maybe some other information about the world is acquired through the English language. Yeah? So, and uh, mostly it's about uh, how to use the language in order to educate yourself in different areas, not, not how to uh, use the language in order to uh, be able to speak, read, write, and um, listen in it, uh, yeah, but because uh, here we have a kind of task-based approach that we first have the task and then we use the English language as a tool to complete this task successfully. Mm. Yeah, that's, um, and that, that's very much, you know, what I aim to achieve doing something like my, my speaking club where we don't necessarily, um, you know, focus on language for language's sake. Uh, much to my chagrin a lot of the time, actually, because I do um, really love um, looking in depth at, at grammatical topics or explaining some vocabulary. So we do do a little bit of that, but mostly my approach is just as you say, we we take as our starting point some interesting topic of discussion, whether that's uh, philosophy or politics or, um, you know, morality, so anything like that. Um, and then, you know, English, it sounds strange for an English speaking club, but English almost becomes of secondary importance. And you just, when, when you really want to express something and you really want to, um, you know, rebut someone's opinion that you don't agree with or to, um, you know, to um, express your opinion, then, um, yeah, it's, it just, the, the language, it just, it sort of creates itself. And uh, yeah, um, yeah but I think that's, that's my um, approach anyway. Um, I think that the language is a uh, really um, essential for, uh, for example, if we speak about the language as a subject, yeah, and the language as a tool, for the majority of people who learn English at courses or with a private tutor, uh, it's about um, uh, being, uh, as it's, it's about perceiving the language, the English language or what, whatever language, as a tool to be able to communicate in it, to read books in it, but in particular fields, yeah, in the fields of their interest and or their maybe business area where they work. And uh, uh, only for maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 percent for those crazy linguists who are fond of uh, digging into structures and finding out the 20th meaning of a phrasal verb, uh, then maybe for them, uh, yeah, the language is a subject. And that's uh, what, uh, for instance, uh, we did at the Moscow State Linguistic University for four, for five years. We studied the language inside out. Yeah, and uh, like we, uh, in order to know it like the back of my palm, just to be to, to understand it, yeah, from from the all the structures and the why it happened, why the, the language evolved, so and not in another way. Yeah, well, a lot of the time the answer is very annoyingly, but very simply, uh, historically, textualist, <laughs> which uh, yes. yeah, that's. Um, Although the regular verbs, uh, children, when they, for example, especially teenagers, they want to get to the bottom of the uh, of the problem, and they they always want to get the a clue why it happened. So, and they ask a question. So, why the regular verbs they exist in the English language? We don't have anything like that in the Russian language. And why do they need those regular verbs? So many of them, the the uh, back pages of the books, such as Murphy grammar, you just 
crammed with <laughs> those <laughs> those irregular verb tables. So what? But that's again that that's that's not a that's not a knowledge problem. That's a perspective problem. They they are looking at the problem from the wrong perspective. They're asking the wrong questions. It's like you know it's it's like as if a mathematician is asking. Um, you know, pi is a really great number. 3.14 is fine, but why does it need to be infinite? Why are there so many strings of digits? I'm like, no, you're asking the wrong questions. That's what happens when you take a base 10 counting system and apply it to an infinite shape, which is what happens. It just breaks. Um, so you're, you're, you're asking the wrong questions and, and asking why. I was talking about this the other day in uh, my podcast with uh, Snezhana, which is yeah. past five, I think, um, about how that's very often, in my opinion, that is one of the silliest questions you can ask when asking the question, why? Well, why is this verb irregular? Because if you say it differently, it is wrong. <laughs> and, and yes, and again, echoing, echoing this uh, subject, again, a bilingual child would never pose such questions because the grammar structure is just uh, uh, engraved in their brains as, it, as they are and they and they don't uh, pose this question because and it's really hard for them to start um, you know uh, decipher all those meanings and uh, uh, trying to um, destruct the sentence the full sentence which is a whole chunk for them and they perceive it it's like a chunk as a whole and then they produce it in their own uh, free flow of speech as a whole and it's really hard for them when they are asked by their uh, for example school teacher to uh, single out the subject the predicate to analyze what kind of predicate we deal with here uh, to find some kind of rules uh, where why present continuous is uh, used in this particular structure yeah and uh, it, 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 the most uh, challenging task for them uh, is to open the brackets mm. when we have gaps and the verbs in brackets and when you have to for example use them in the right tense or uh, transform them somehow yeah they can't just understand what they asked what they expected from in this uh, particular task because it, it comes natural to them they mm. have never posed this question <laughs> yeah right, so yeah precisely very good example very good the um the most I think hilarious example of a student that I had with this, this was a person who um, I'm not going to say her name, uh, but she was, she was a young girl and she was one of those people who um, let's say if some people don't believe that you can be born with a linguistic or a non-linguistic brain, by the way, that's nonsense. But um, this person certainly was born with a non-linguistic brain. She, she put up a lot, a lot of resistance to learning English. Mm -hmm. and, one of the best examples of, of this type of question that I, like a, a silly why question was um, she said Mike look what well, in, in Russian but I'll say it in English here yeah. uh, Mike look we, in in Russian we have these um, two words we have um, ruka and we have ruchka well, I know this is a pencil but whatever uh, and she said but in English you have hand and you have pen like and she just couldn't understand like it's, it, yeah, I, I don't need to explain to you how um, how infuriating that question was for me to try and answer, but it's yeah, it just shows that some. I would people, feel puzzled really to start answering this question. Yeah, <laughs> some people really have tunnel vision um, mm -hmm. and, and and really um, just cannot accept the fact that um, not all languages are one language, <laughs> you know, pronounced uh, with with different sounds and written Even with different. Translation doesn't work properly uh, because. Uh, there can be different words for one concept, which is, uh, for example, stall in Russian, but we have a table, a stand bar, a desk, many other things that can denote it stall in Russian, yeah, but different things. So, and, and then we have passportny stall, which is a whole other different universe of, uh, of infuriation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's say um, just just to, to literally for one minute to bring it back to the bilingual topic because I wanted to ask some practical advice here if um, you know Dasha and I um, are, are to have um, kids at some point um, what is what's the practical advice because I really don't know how I would do this would like so just to give you context um, the language we speak at home is Russian um, 
but obviously we live in the UK. So, you know, my child would go to school here and speak with English speaking kids. And then in terms of in the home, should we speak Russian with him or should I speak English with him and Dash should speak Russian? And then what about if we're at the dinner table? How well, that... in your situation, it's as easy as pie because we uh, deal with an old Pole family, one parent, one language, and you can easily speak uh, English with your baby and uh, your wife can speak Russian. Yeah, and uh, uh, first uh, we will uh, have this uh, with them like um, code switching phenomenon, when your child, uh, when he or she starts speaking, um, they will um, maybe mix some words, yeah? And for example, responding to you uh, in English, um, he or she may insert some Russian words in the responses. Mm -hmm. But this phenomenon doesn't last for a long time. Usually, if you start at the very beginning, at the birth time, then by the year of three or four, at least it, it stops. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, then you will um, uh, brag the uh, fact that you have a bilingual, a natural bilingual <laughs> child, yeah, mm -hmm. responding in Russian to his mom and or her mom and in English to you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, the, the child will understand that there are two systems of languages, that there are two separate languages, and the system will, uh, th those systems will get uh, separately in uh, uh, his or her mind, because, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they will overlap, but this process wouldn't take more than two, three years. Mm. Mm. All right, then. And what about if we're all at the dinner table? When, so when it's me and Dasha and the child, should we speak Russian like we normally do, or how does that work? Uh, you see, it's the, it depends on what language you are speaking with each other. So if you, you are addressing Dasha with in English, yeah, then the child... No, we, me, me and Dasha speak Russian at home. Then he will speak Russian at dinner table. Mm -hmm. That yeah. will be the code of your meal time. The secret, the secret code. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, for instance, we didn't have this old Paul uh, family. Uh, my, uh, my husband doesn't speak a word of uh, English. Uh, he speaks German a little bit, and of course his native, uh, his native tongue is, is uh, Russian. And uh, it was only me who uh, fostered my child in uh, this English-speaking environment. And, uh, um, uh, and of course I had to, to speak Russian with my husband. So uh, my baby uh, quickly understood that I could speak Russian too. And since we have the uh, whole world who speaks Russian uh, outside our flat, uh, it was a great uh, challenge for me to um, kind of sparkle his interest uh, to English and mm. to maintain it. Because um, we, we uh, first of all, we introduced that it was a kind of rule that if uh, my son is bathing, he speaks only English. Uh, it was from the very beginning uh, of his life. Then, when he, we walked, when we walked with him in a forest, in a park, somewhere, we spoke only English. When we played with a particular toy, uh, which was a teddy bear who came from London, so he didn't know a word in Russian, so we had to speak English with him. Mm -hmm. uh, when we played with the penguins. Um, and there, 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 is, there is a kind of course uh, designed specially for preschoolers. It's called Penguins English. And they, are, they provide us uh, with uh, rubber toys of penguins, different like family of penguins, lots of them. They're all different. And uh, also when we played with those toys, we played only in English. Mm. So um, we kind of, we anchored English to all those different activities. And so my son quickly understood that if we take this penguin, then we, we start speaking English, not Russian. Interesting. Okay, so I think we've I think we've covered the bilingual topic. Um, tell me about uh, metaphors. Mm -hmm. we, we were talking before we, we taped this show about um, a, a sort of, I suppose, a shared interest in, in metaphors. Having said that, you are uh, by far and away a, a, a much more advanced specialist than I am. Uh, I think you wrote a PhD thesis on, on uh, connected with metaphors. Yeah. yeah, that was the uh, uh, topic of my thesis. Uh, well, actually, um, 
I've always been interested in um, figurative language. I think that no other language in the world is so rich and abundant in figurative language than the English is. Uh, because uh, it's all about those idioms, uh, limitless, endless collocations, set phrases, phrasal verbs, that it's so hard to apply for CAE, CP level students, because it's where this, uh, this language for um, experts begins. Yeah, because as I say, it uh, A1, A2 levels are just English for fun. B1, B2 is just the basic English where, which you need to be able to survive in the uh, uh, foreign language environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, C1, C2 uh, is the language for experts, for real experts who would like to... <laughs> um, that, that's a very bold Why? statement. One, one second, that's a very bold statement that English is um, more figurative and more metaphorical than almost any other language. Is what do you base that on? I don't know that that's true. I mean, compare it to Russian, for example. I, I, I don't, don't use so many idioms in our daily life. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, no, no, no. Uh, it's um, it's one hundred percent. I'm sure in it because we yeah, we do we had, we do have lots of figurative stuff. We do have this uh, stylistic to the separate subject in philological departments of the universities. Uh, we do have a. Um, outstanding poets like Pushkin Lermontov and outstanding uh, prominent writers like Dostoevsky who, uh, and Bulgakov who uh, made an extensive use of figurative language in their, uh, in, their, um, in, in their writing. But still, uh, in comparison with English language, when you have just uh, at least one idiom heard in three minutes, <laughs> It so do you have any sort of um, data on, because I'm not trying to do like a gotcha here, I'm just, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in, Again, you know. based on, on your sort of opinion, or it, it, do you have some data or evidence to back this up? It's just my opinion, but I think that I should do some research in order to, uh, to prove uh, my hypothesis. But uh, for instance, uh, it was not um, earlier than yesterday. They went had a walk with my son, uh, and uh, he decided to make an to do this experiment. Actually, he said, um, "Do you think that um, if you speak English, you will use any idiom in five minutes?" Mm -hmm. uh, I asked. He I answered that. Okay, let's let's um, we just discuss some Star Wars topics. I don't know what he is interested in again, and I uh, I was speaking for we were uh, like we were walking for an hour, and he registered like mentally he registered those idioms that I used. So I used twelve idioms uh, in in sixty minutes. Uh, speaking only in English, and I'm not a native speaker. I think that if I were a native speaker, I would use even more. But it means that I used one idiom in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, in in uh, in Russian, I would use maybe two three idioms a day. <laughs> sure, but we're we're getting into the anecdotal now. Um, so without data, I don't think we can make um, statements uh, like that at this stage. However. When we talk about metaphors, I mean, idioms are not the be all and end all, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that there's, there's levels of analysis at which, well, you know, the vast majority of our speech is, is entirely metaphorical. But so I just let, let's back up a little bit here and talk about um, the, the actual the word metaphor itself, because it's, um, it's a bit more complicated than I think people um would like to give it credit for because there are i i would say to and again you are more of an expert here than i am but um i think there are two types of metaphor that we need to pass so there's um a a like more poetic metaphor which as you were talking about you know someone like pushkin or Lermontov might use um or indeed you know i think an idiom would fall into that category and then there's a conceptual metaphor and i think they are two different things so um People, people who come to my speaking club know that I love um, breaking this word down in terms of etymology. So, first of all, um, a metaphor. Um, it's quite annoying. I don't have a whiteboard because people are going to be listening to this, so I can't draw anything. But um, let's look at that word and break it down. Meta and for. So the root of that word, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, but still, um, this uh, for 
the, the root of this word comes from Greek, meaning uh, carry. Mm -hmm. um, like, like um, so for example, Lucifer is the same root, Luc mm -hmm. Lucifer, that's uh, carrier of light. Lux is light, mm -hmm. and this uh, Fores is, is, is carry. So that's why if you, um, actually, if you go to Greece and you want to move house, you call up this, uh, you know, Gruzopiriwoski company, and on the side of the van, you will see the word metaphores. Because metaphores mm -hmm. in Greek just means Piriwoski, and that's the it's the same um, idea, like it, like in Russian, how we say, you know, like Pirinostum Smuisli, it's exactly the same idea, because meta means across, and fores means carry, so you're carrying the sense across. So yeah. it's like a vehicle, which is kind of weird because the word metaphor is itself a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's kind of weird. Um, now, in, in terms of a poetic metaphor, why, why don't you take over here? Could you, um, for, for people who may not remember from literature lessons, what is a metaphor in terms of literature, in terms of a poetic device? Mm, so uh, in terms of this type of metaphor, yeah, it uh, uh, belongs to the set of uh, stylistic devices yeah and uh, they are used by poets by writers by just ordinary people who are creating some kind of creative writing for instance or just an essay or an article right they use the uh, metaphors in order to make the language more eloquent mm -hmm. in order to convey a message maybe more precisely uh, and uh, if we deal with the other type of metaphors, which are conceptual metaphors, they are ingrained in uh, the language as a system. And they, are, they no, don't serve this purpose of making your speech more eloquent. They just convey the message. And mm. that's, for instance, uh, we can speak about perceiving time in the English language as a container in the expression of in time. Yeah, just I'll be in time. So it means that I'll be in some container because usually we use in preposition of place with some um, types of containers. But on the other hand, yeah, the, one of the same phenomenon can be perceived differently. For example, we can say on time and this in that case and that. A particular case of the usage of this conceptual metaphor will deal it, uh, with the perceiving of time as a surface because on, meaning that you are like standing or sitting on some kind of surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we also have this concept of perceiving time as a building. For instance, in the majority of cases, we can say we will see each other at five. It means that at, like even if, if we speak about prepositions of place, yeah, then at will mean some kind of building at which we are meeting each other. So time is perceived as building in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think the same, you could, you could draw the same analogy with um, perceiving time as a container and perceiving time as a fixed point or indeed a surface. Yeah. When you say something like um, in January, in the month of January, yeah. on January the 1st. Um, but... Um, I think some people may still need a bit more um, convincing. So let, and I just want to rewind a bit because I think people may have missed the difference between, you know, something like um, Shakespeare saying, um, to thee I would compare a summer's day. I know whoever's listening to this, I got that wrong, but it's, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Um, Oscar Wilde said, a gentleman never quotes correctly, which is an interesting idea because those people who, when they say a quotation, have to get the words exactly correct, they are showing that for them it's more important to show that they know the quotation than to mm -hmm. actually correctly convey the message of the quotation. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Also, I probably, in the same spirit, I probably got the Oscar Wilde quote wrong, but it kind of proves my point if I did. Um, so there's this difference between like this, you know, Shakespearean sonnet saying when, you know, your neck is like a swan and your eyes are like the moon and all of that stuff, which is technically a simile, but you know, the same idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then a conceptual metaphor, which is um, perhaps e even um, a, a better way of illustrating that than, than time is a container, albeit a less precise way than yours, um, would be to say that a, a, a metaphor that exists in, well, in most language, but certainly, certainly in English and certainly in Russian, is that time is a precious resource. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you think about time from a physical standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, it's not obvious that that should be a metaphor. But think about, you know, to save time, to, yeah. time, to waste time. Um, to, and in, in Russian, we might say to economize on time, which um, I think really give, gives the game away in terms of um, Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. metaphors there. Um, but, but we also speak about time as a bird, as a living being, because uh, a, a, a time flies. 
birds fly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we can also see uh, that time can be a kind of burden or maybe a weak person who drags behind, or time drags. Uh, so it can be personified, I mean. So it's mm -hmm. another, another feature of time. Yeah, the sort of, um, and what do you call it, anthropomorphosis of, um, um, of um, conceptual metaphors. Yeah, An another one would be, um, uh, um, is that power is up. Yeah. Strength is up. That's why you say, because if you think about it, there is no reason why you should say um, the king rules over his kingdom. Why mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. why, why not you, yes, you yes, because power is up. Mm -hmm. exactly power is up so that's why you say um you know um the, the lion is above the antelope in the food chain um mm -hmm. i am superior i am your supervisor super right. means up or above and visor as in vision as in visor as in video means looking down the same in russian you say you know madzor, madzor, actually is that you know is mm -hmm. looking downwards on on, on something um by the way, uh, just your words reminded me about one more metaphor, which is up. If we speak about things that are strong, they are usually up. For example, if we say about um, uh, pe people's emotions, he's boiling with anger or rage. Mm. Uh, he's boiling with rage, yeah, because uh, like boiling, it means that the temperature is up and his feelings are very strong. Mm -hmm. But if we if we see, uh, for example, another another um, idiom. It's an idiomatic expression that uh, you need to keep the lid on. Mm -hmm. So if the lid is off, then the, then the liquid, which is actually emotions, will uh, go out of the pot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it will boil. It will be boiled up to this degree where it's just starting uh, coming over the pot. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's also about... Yeah, and, and I think th this is one of the most powerful cases against um, all of those tabula rasa lunatics out there um, to, to really show that there, there is a universal human nature. And at some level of analysis, we all speak the same cognitive language. That's not to say that we think in language. We certainly don't get your head out of the 19th century if you think that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have the shared cognitive um you know perception of of the world um mentalese as um, as stephen pinker puts it so sort of like chinese but in in mental language so you you know shared mentalese um and this you remember when we were um texting yesterday and uh, i brought up the uh, the buba kiki effect i think that's yeah. a related um experiment yeah. Um, again, this is going to be quite hard to explain without showing, but I'll try. So the Buba Kiki, if I actually have a video on this on, on my yeah. page. Um, and so if you if you imagine, OK, there, there are two new shapes. Um, so our best, our top geometrists have uh, invented these two different shapes. OK, and they look like this. So the shape number one is like a, a really kind of spiky uh -huh. uh, red shape it's all spiky yes. like a, yeah like a sea urchin like a like a hedgehog spiky shape mm -hmm. and then the the shape number two is not spiky that's like a sort of bloop 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 like a like a bubbly almost like a thought so, bubble in a comic tangles and corners. exactly now um we've got these two shapes now we need to give them names mm -hmm. so i can tell you that one of these shapes is called a booba mm -hmm. and one of these shapes is called a kiki Mm -hmm. So, if I ask you, Yulia, which, in your opinion, is the booba? The hedgehog <laughs> is a kiki. Yeah. The cloud is a booba. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had, I, to I think that this this comes from it's, this is a technique, and I think that this comes from the neurolinguistics programming. Do you? I, yeah, but because are you implying that it's that it's from that it's socially. That's given to us uh, uh, I, I, I uh, had an experience of teaching English to would-be politicians and they uh, were taught how to use the proper language in uh, diplomatic negotiations. And they were taught that uh, those words that sound uh, pricky and uh, stick and uh, sharp and mm -hmm. pointy, yeah, you should avoid them because they would create an atmosphere of tense and suspense in your negotiations. Mm -hmm. Hi, maybe I misunderstood you. When when you say that it's it's because of neurolinguistic programming, do you mean that we have those conceptions because society has told us that, or do you mean that 
you 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 shouldn't use those words because we already have that in our human nature. We shouldn't. Yeah, the second one, I think. Oh, yeah, okay. I understood that. Sorry, we were, I, thought, we I thought you were saying that it's a social construct. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. So we were born with this perception, and of course, yeah. if we are addressed with such words, we become like tense. Um, yeah, precisely. Um, that's um, that. that. That's a very. That's a. Um, and it's exactly what you know. What I'm trying to say that. Um, the fact that that works with no matter what language you speak, no matter what nationality you are, it's a human universal, just like smiling is a human universal. Mm -hmm. Just like um, the, when you, um, I can't remember whose book this was, but they, they it was like a sort of a, a chronology of universal things that we all share, all humans. Um, so, sometimes the, the, the detail is, is incredible. So smiling or laughing being a human universal, that's kind of predictable. But did you know, for example, that every culture ever discovered on the planet has a specific type of music associated with childcare? Mm -hmm. that's really, that's really detailed. And, yeah. but, it, it's, but it's at the same time, not surprising because I'm a human and I understand why that's the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, if we speak about those differences in cultures and the ways they perceive uh, things around them, I think that uh, an interesting idea I once read about, the uh, difference in perception um, at doom or something like destiny in English and the Russian cultures. Because uh, when we say in English that, that, for instance, he was run over by a car, um, we, well, in the majority of cases, they wouldn't, I don't know, maybe you will now object to this, uh, but in the majority of phrases, uh, they, in, the, in cases, they would say, you would say, he, um, no, the car ran over him. So you wouldn't use the passive voice in the structure, would you? Um, I, I personally would. I, I would say he got run over by a car. I'd use the get passive. Mm hmm uh, and then, uh, then it contradicts with that statement because they proved it that in the English culture, they uh, try to um, uh, take responsibilities and show the responsibility uh, for things that happen from like extra powers with people. Like, for example, in comparison with the Russian culture, we mm -hmm. tend to think that it happened to us, but we don't have to do it. We don't have uh, anything to, uh, to prevent. Yeah. It prevents this action, yeah? That, so that. it happens just because machinas bila, uh, no, papal uh, pod machino, yeah? And uh, uh, so I, I couldn't avoid it, yeah? So actually um, this uh, idea that uh, the Russian uh, people perceive destiny as some kind of doom and fatal phenomenon, and they don't, uh, they, they just, uh, can't uh, pull up the pull up themselves together. They just do anything about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't read the study, but that sounds like a lot of neo warfian nonsense to me. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll forgive me for saying so, but I mean, you you could very easily say, you know, you was a machine, or you could say on papal babari. Is you know, there's really, it's very easy to 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 get round it in terms of subject object in Russian. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, with all respect to those authors, I, I haven't read the study, so I don't know, you know, what I'm talking about. But it, it sounds like uh, neo warfianism to me, mm -hmm. of which I am not a fan. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, researchers try to invent something new, and uh, in with this purpose, they uh, their statements turn to be rather far fetched and uh, very distant from life. <laughs> yeah, so from exhibit A, look, look at um, any American university right now um, and you'll, you'll see um, a, a million examples to prove what you're saying is completely correct, especially in social sciences, especially in social sciences. Um, but when you mentioned this concept of perceiving um, a time as something precious, for example, some kind of treasure yeah mm. uh we also can see this concept in the adjective open-hearted that the whole body is perceived as a container and the, the heart is the most precious part uh, hidden inside it yeah maybe mm. the treasure hidden and if you like open your heart to people you can be regarded as opening the most precious things oh, yeah yeah it's like it's like a little secret jewelry box yeah, yeah so that, that ties in with um with heart of gold in english mm -hmm. 
that's um that speaking of phrases it's not really metaphors here but um, speaking of phrases which are so ingrained in the language that we don't know about them a lot of them are shakespeare's phrases i mean yeah. heart of gold shakespeare invented that phrase Mm -hmm. um and there's this there's a huge list i'm not going to bore you yeah, contributes it largely to the language system yeah. yeah that that's um that's one way of saying it <laughs> he certainly uh did upgrade the language to use the modern parlance mm -hmm. um you know a, a nice um example as well of um a metaphor which so speaking of these metaphors which we we they are so deeply ingrained in language that we have no idea that we're speaking in metaphors that we are just <laughs> lost in metaphors even if you think you are um being as you know direct as you can be with your language you are speaking almost entirely in metaphors um so uh, an example which I, I i sometimes use with my class to talk about this is um so imagine um okay so imagine the nearest statue of lenin which i'm sure uh, is ubiquitous in wherever you live in Russia. Um, the one that I'm thinking of in on, on the central square in uh, Chimin is uh, Lenin outside the city administration building going like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for, for people who are listening, not watching, I'm just pointing forward. Why is he pointing forward? What's he pointing towards? Mm -hmm. So? <laughs> towards the, the bright communist future. Mm -hmm. Now, stop for a second. Why is he not pointing backwards? Because backwards is past. Okay, why is backwards past? It's written on my t-shirt, don't look backwards, it's not the way we are going to. <laughs> exactly. But but explain that. What and you, you when you ask someone to explain this, a lot of the time that you know, if you say why is future forward, they'll think that you're a lunatic. They'll they'll simply, you know, and you you can see this when I, I asked this in, in a class, I think it's a video of it. And um someone's trying to explain the metaphor of course future is forward because you know time goes in a line and you know if it goes forward then that's future if it goes back then that's past and i'm mm -hmm. like okay but you still didn't explain why the metaphor exists why is future forward why is future not backwards tell me why and you can't explain it without committing like a circular logic error and referring to the metaphor that you're trying to explain so it's it's true because it's true because it's true because it's true it's a circular logic yeah. um and so an interesting, um, an interesting sort of alternate uh, viewpoint on this is, um, so the, the Aymara people, uh, it, which is a, 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 um, a South American tribe who are, inhabit modern day Peru, if I'm not mistaken, they have a different way of, of um, talking about time. Mm -hmm. is, um, if you, and you can see video footage of them. There was quite an extensive study done on these people, I think in the 1970s. Uh, and presumably after that as well um there's video footage of these people saying oh yeah our tribe has lived in these hills um you know since the time of my great great grandfather and he, he's pointing forward meaning in the past because mm -hmm. for those people the past is forward because mm -hmm. what's in front of you you can see it's apparent so that's what you've already lived through but the future is backwards Mm -hmm. because it's behind you it's not apparent it's not visible it's not understandable so that's the future is what you have yet to encounter i mean i i can't argue with that logic it may it makes as much sense as time as an yeah, arrow i agree with you on rights i'm on the same page with you here because it's actually the, the uh, matter of uh, how uh, um this idea, these ideas are incorporated and ingrained in the memory of the whole culture and the ancestors, the, our ancestors' memory. And I think mm -hmm. that this is what we uh, take after our ancestors, is uh, patterns of perceiving information around, so, around us. And well, it's kind, kind of cultural, um, uh, cultural phenomenon because the different cultures perceive different types of the white color yeah, like Eskimos, they perceive 64, if I'm not mistaken, uh, different shades of white color, uh, while we have only one word, just white. Yeah, I'm, I, I've, I've, I've read those studies. Um, again, I'm very skeptical of those results. The, the, the best you can show is, um, for example, that there's, there's a similar sort of, in my opinion, kind of nonsense claim that Russians uh, have more of an ability to perceive blue because we have the, you know, these words global boy and senior also. Um, 
nonsense completely there's no evidence to back that up at all the most you can show in some studies is about a, you know like a 60 millisecond difference in someone hitting a key um it's really not enough evidence to show that you know different cultures because of how they speak uh, i mean i'm, I'm presuming you, you're not a warfian so I, I i'm lecturing someone who who doesn't believe this but but still um you know the, the idea that language affects how you speak it, it, or how you think is um is way 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 wrong um yeah it's, it's well off the mark but yeah you're definitely correct in, in the sense that not only a culture but it's definitely deeper than that as well it's 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 human nature it's it's this universal um you know cognitive um i, I don't want to say cognitive language because then that that um you know makes it sound like i'm talking about the language can influence thought which it can't um, it, it, this universal mental um, system, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and and I think that's that's true about all of our stories as well. And that you know, stories are we are a storytelling people. Um, we the way that we understand the world is through stories. So, for example, if you wanted to explain to someone why is um, why is future forward. You would explain it using a story you would say well imagine that you are yeah. an explorer and you are walking along a path and you're trying to find your goal and the goal is in front of you and the goal will also be in front of you in time um so to speak that's why future is forward and I say, okay yeah that that kind of makes sense that kind of makes sense um and, it, yeah. and the, the same thing like you know if you, if you watch like a you know these classic archetypal like for children's cartoons are, are a good one because they are very archetypal stories the lion king it's not immediately obvious why should a lion be a king? Mm -hmm. Well, because a lion has this sort of majestic looking mane, it's powerful, it's strong, it rules over a kingdom, over a territory. And so it starts to make sense in a way that the snail king or the amoeba king or the, I don't know, or something, it doesn't make sense because that, that, that metaphor doesn't work in our, um, in our sort of universal cognitive language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, metaphors are great. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> we can't live without them. It's part and parcel of our daily life, metaphors as well as idioms. <laughs> and they are very often intertwined. Of course, yeah. All right, we've been going for, uh, for over an hour. So I think that's... Um, Time flies. <laughs> it does indeed. Time flies both uh, figuratively and literally in this case. Um, okay, I'm going to go and uh, buy a new cover for my motorbike because um, it's uh, sure. soaked through. And, uh, yeah, for your motorbike, really. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much um, for your time. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope we can do this um, again sometime. Thank uh, you. Thank you for having invited me. No problem at Showing all. You. My pleasure. Oh, but wait, one more question. Please. Is this your dog, which is at the very beginning of Campfire? video yeah, clip yeah, hang on, you can see him I mean, right Labrador. Here. so here he is well, hang on let me turn my light off he's fantastic he's Fred. oh my you god might yeah, recognize. He's so this is cute. this is the start of campfire so that's Fred's ah bed. yes yes now i see i recognize this yeah picture great what's his name fred i yes, see yes sir. so there we go that's that's how the start of campfire normally looks but fred was but yeah, he doesn't understand English. Yeah, I don't have a bilingual dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting thing, actually. You should do, um, your next thesis should be about bilingualism in dogs, because uh, he doesn't understand English. I, I, wanted, I wanted to raise my doggy bilingual, especially uh, taking into consideration that he's Corgi, a Welsh breed. <laughs> but I decided not to experiment, because I once read that they would start mixing up words, uh, commands, I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want proof that Fred is uh, not bilingual? <laughs> some food, 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 time to eat, breakfast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> amazing, so amazing. He's, he's, um, he's only Russian. Okay, I'm going to go feed Thank my you. Dog, otherwise that's cruelty. So thanks once again. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.